You're very kind. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, all right. You'll be disappointed that you can in a moment, I'm sure. But uh, that, that, that's me. And you can see I've got the name of the presentation wrong, so that was a good start. But I did notice. <laughs> but I did notice. I thought I'd go on, I'd have a look. And you can see there are wonderful images. It's kind of, it's a very old phrase, hands across the water, hands across the sea. But in the online version that I'd printed out of the program, actually, it was hand across the sea or hand across the water. And I suggested to my wife that I had a sort of a dismembering type uh, association, which may not be unwelcome. But uh, she said she made the sign that she usually does, which was this. I thought, ah, now I understand. Hand across the sea. This means something quite different. Um, what it is, I'm not sure. Anyway, hands. That seems to be the key topic. And so I, I thought we'd have a quick look at uh, a lot of hand holding that's been going on um, amongst politicians. And you can see that hand holding is used for a whole range of purposes. Uh, one is to guide, uh, this, this lady on the left is guiding this rather lost looking gentleman on her right, or her left, uh, it's not sure where. And then we've got uh, Nelson Mandela thinking, what can I do that will embarrass Tony Blair? I'll hold his hand and you can see Tony doesn't quite know what to do with that. Um, and then we've got North and South Korea who are now best friends. Isn't it fantastic what you can do with just a hand across the water? Um, and we'll see more of the other two gentlemen later on. Um, it, as you probably know, um, this is all part of the European semester of psychology. I don't know how much longer we can use that phrase based in this country. Hopefully we, we can for uh, as long as is possible. Um, and this is what it says on the website about what um, the European semester for psychology means. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of hand-holding going on there. So I had thought, when, you, when you're alone in the dark with your slides, wouldn't it be nice to ask members of the audience now to hold hands? And I can see a number of you have deliberately anticipated that and sat as far away from each other as possible. So, but <laughs> if, for those who are at the front row, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there's some hand-holding going on there. OK, all right. Feel free to reach behind you. Uh, or <laughs> OK, excuses to get phone numbers and stuff. All right, OK. Um, but I thought, I, I thought more about uh, relationships between the, the UK and other countries. Uh, and then I thought, where are we going? Nottingham, of course. And you'll probably uh, have seen the, the, the famous uh, sheriff of Nottingham, played by Basil Rathbone, who I think was a Nottinghamshire lad, went to school in Repton, I understand. Um, and you can see Errol Flynn um, having a, you know, just exchanging European views. Because back in those days, of course, uh, England, as then was known, was just an add-on to Normandy. Um, and France. And we seem to have flipped it round in our minds so that we kind of thinking by Tudor times we owned bits of France. It was always the other way around. And interesting how history gets written. Um, oh, more hand holding here. But of course, you need to know what you're doing. Um, so I, I'd like to go back, to, if I may, and take you back in time to 1973. This is a, 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 an interesting year, and many of you, I'm sure, won't remember 1973, so I'll brief you quickly. Um, Britain joined the European uh, Economic Community, it then was. There was a commemorative coin, and you can see the Queen's hand. There is a woman's hand along with the men's hands representing the other countries at that time. Um, lots of sad and difficult and tragic things going on in the world, as I know we're used to year in, year out. But of course, there are seeds of hope, as there must be. And as a lifelong Leeds United supporter, I wanted to draw your attention <laughs> to what a great year was about to happen for that wonderful team. And of course, Britain joins the EEC. Um, here we go very quickly. If you look at the uh, European Semester for Psychology and you look at the European Federation of Psychologists, you'll see, just as we have in terms of the aspirations and great ideas for the BPS and its future, that the European Federation of Psychologists equally has been thinking about the priorities. And this was just one statement quite recently. And you can see again the emphasis on the mental health workforce. We've heard about mental health of students. But uh, equally, I'm acutely aware, as I'm sure you are, the mental health of those providing the psychological support, whether it's in practitioners or in universities, uh, and indeed as students. Um, and we have surveys showing high levels of psychological not just strain, but distress amongst uh, people who are practicing as psychologists, helping and supporting the psychological needs of others. And this, I hope, will be a priority area as well to address. Um, we, uh, we, well, we, we will probably all know someone who's in that situation, experiencing the difficulties of that. So it's good to see that Europe is thinking of this. Um, 
Is this political psychology? Terry very kindly asked. Let's mention political psychology. I will unashamedly plug it a few times. Um, but I wanted to convince you of a model, potentially, that if politics is about power, and power is about control, perhaps another word for it, then actually we all need a certain level of control over our lives and well-being and motivation are all part of this. Um, but could you argue, therefore, that all behaviour is political? Because in some way, all behaviour is shaped towards enhancing, providing the control, if indeed not of ourselves, but of others, empowering clients, students, organisations, etc. Hands up if you think that, that might wash if I repeated that in another place. Thank you both. You're very kind. OK, all right. Well, there's, OK. Uh, it's good to get a hand up from the head of the research board, you think, because there's always an eye on publications, isn't there, when you work in it? You, you know, OK, um, here's a model which takes it to a ridiculous length. Um, but I'm trying to, again, suggest that things that you would ascribe to politicians, we might see in everyday behaviour. We ourselves are um, experiencing and enacting many of these things. And I've tried to tack on some psychological constructs to, to give it some apparent credence, which, of course, is totally spurious, I'm sure. But you can see my point I'm trying to make is that we're all acting as politicians in some kind of way. Is it fair to say it's all about control? I, I, it's one of my favourite photographs, uh, and this was... Uh, I looked a lot like this, A, before I had a haircut, but B, while I was preparing the slides. And I suppose the idea of kind of that control in some way, again, is fundamental to well-being, but also that, uh, aside from it being in the number of psychological models, it's a very powerful tool. And the phrase, take back control, has a lot to do with kind of where we are in terms of relations with the European Union and the whole Brexit thing, and was a very successful um, phrase used by the, the Leave campaign. And of course, I'm not here to say what's right or wrong, um, but I noticed the same phrase is being picked up by a new anti-trolling campaign, um, and I think there's a record being released to uh, suggest that trolls on the internet, I just thought I'd clarify that because some of you were thinking, these are people in interesting novels I may remember from a few years ago. But trolls on the internet are actually in need themselves. And that act of bullying and whatever is a representation of the angst that they experience. And this is a new way of tackling trolling, which I thought could be a refreshing psychological insight. So watch, watch that space and watch out for the phrase, take back control, coming round again soon. Um, in terms of control at work, we, we know it's important. I just wanted to say a bit about a particular job or two. And that's the job of the national politician. Um, we know, for example, in terms of many other jobs as civil servants um, or indeed um, anyone related to politics, that actually the problems that we all experience in terms of workload, lack of control, issues around social support, and the unexpected events which take away control will predict as a peak, a spike in psychological distress, and it's no different amongst MPs, and that's something that I've been researching, and I realised with uh, some horror that um, when I first presented on this, it was exactly 25 years ago, in 1993, in Blackpool, um, which I kind of, I have mixed feelings about, and I'm sure you do, hearing that, saying that probably confirms why he's so out of date and why he's a Leeds United fan. But <laughs> politicians are indeed human, and that's the key point I wanted you to make, to, to make really, because we have our ambitions for what they should be and how they should present themselves. I think Joyce Bander from Malawi is always a, a, a positive example. Uh, though there may well be someone from Malawi who says, no, <laughs> we've got a problem. But these are the kind of characteristics which uh, we, we would ascribe and we would hope for in our politicians. Uh, just look at these, consistent and clear, healthy, clean living, honest. In other words, they are just like another occupational group we could identify. Psychologists. Aren't these the same characteristics that we would expect that our clients, our students, our colleagues and others would expect? But how easy is it to be a politician? Please don't read all my words on there. Um, although uh, I, I kind of felt comforted by one of Saab's slides, actually, which has lots of different things on. This is not quite the PowerPoint slide of doom, but it's getting that way in terms of how packed it is. But being an MP is a difficult job. No, we should not feel sorry for the MP for putting themselves forward to do it. But the issue I wanted to raise very quickly is this. If you're in that position to make decisions that govern the lives of not just tens of thousands, but potentially millions of people, how well equipped are you? How 
well functioning are you in terms of your ability to take those decisions and make those choices? And we would hope that people come from a range of experiences and when they take up those roles. But what is being done to support people in those roles? Psychologically, what's actually happening? There is occupational health support in the House of Commons, for example. The Scottish and Welsh uh, institutions decided they didn't need that level of support for their representatives, which was worrying. Um, but we do know of many cases where psychological stress is a real issue for politicians. And I was saying to Terry before, I was kindly invited to speak in Ireland five years ago with the health minister, shortly after a member of the Irish government um, or a minister had committed suicide. Um, so we know that there are very high levels of distress in many jobs, and politicians are no different, whatever we might think of them and their views. Um, I won't speak for too much longer, but I just wanted to compare levels of distress and some of the findings we're seeing. The sample sizes are quite different. The studies I do on that politicians are a very small scale, obviously. But the um, Savoy BPS survey shows high levels of pressure on those who are in the psychology professions. I'll move on very quickly because I know we've got a little limited time and I wanted to show you not just the demands at work, which again um, may seem familiar to many of us in the room here, um, and a, a slide. That's just to show that I know how to do some quantitative stats, so please don't <laughs> worry about that. But, um, and just to pick up on a couple of comments, um, probably one of the greatest exponents of political philosophy um, made a comment about the job and its impact on what we should want. And so I've, I've written down Edwina Curry's words on this slide, um, along with those of John Stuart Mill, um, who provided a very clear um, aspiration for what we would hope from politics and politicians. And then we contrast that with some of the practitioners. And I was very interested to see what President Trump had to say about the job. I thought it would be easier. I miss my old life. There are some graphs which show something about personality. I very quickly wanted to move on to just these correlations, if I may. Where I found that MPs and national politicians were experiencing low levels of control, as they are in situations where political decisions get out of hand. And that's been their experience with Brexit. They did not expect this to happen right across the board. You can see some interesting relationships between personality traits and not just their, their, their ideas about control, but their experiences of the job. And actually to the point where those scoring high on conscientiousness decided to stand down, many of them. What does that say about who's left? Um, I just pose the question. Very quickly, Brexit, because I, I was told it's a good idea to mention Brexit, so there's a slide with the word Brexit got to do in it, but again, affecting MPs. I was asked to go to the House of Commons this week and meet with a group who were talking about what might happen next. Um, and one of the issues raised was, should there be another vote? Um, personally, not that my view is important at all, I'm kind of thinking, well, democracy is democracy. People have made a decision. I guess you could say there's a decision yet to be made about the terms of leaving. And let's hope that leaving doesn't include severing ties and setting sail and actually taking the island out into the Atlantic, which if you believe the media, seems to be what some of the rhetoric is talking about. It doesn't need to be that way. And I hope for professional bodies and the relationships which are thriving and so important to both our countries that these things will continue. Um, the top bit I put in bold there because I suppose that's the $64 question. Suppose you have a politician in charge bent on a particular course of action, perhaps unable to deviate from that because their personality is such or maybe that their state of psychological health is such that they need help and would be better stepping down. One prime minister has done that, Kjell Magna Bondovic from Norway, recognised his depression, recognised it was affecting his job, stood down, and I'm glad to say was re-elected subsequently when he was well again. So there are positive things we can do to tackle stigma around mental health in all occupational groups. Politics does not need to be any different. But in terms of parting, I suppose, I need to ask you to study the faces on this photograph and ask you the question, who is in control? You're not looking at the second row, are you? You're looking at two people who are running the show at the moment in Europe. Um, and uh, interesting how, how well they get on, I thought. Um, can psychologists help? I hope political psychology, I hope you'll vote for a new section of political psychology, may contribute to some of the positive things that can go on here. 
Um, there's a picture of Basil Rathbone again, dressed as Sherlock Holmes. I'm not quite sure why. But I want to make the point about our different occupational groups in, within psychology, different disciplines that can help. Bear with me, I'm going to fast forward. You mentioned the all-party parliamentary group, Nicola, uh, and as a report that, that was launched in, back in November, uh, written by Nancy Doyle and somebody else, um, and is chaired, the, the APPG is chaired by Lisa Cameron. And it's great to be in Parliament and promote some of the stuff that we can do. Um, again, uh, did I mention political psychology already? I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> if, if anyone feels I'm overselling this, I, I, it's fine just to boo and hiss. Yeah. Keep going. OK, uh, don't stop. But the International Society of Political Psychology is 40 years old. Last year, we, we went there and launched a collaboration with the Political Studies Association. Um, and not to have a UK political studies, political um, psychology group, it seemed like a, a bit of an omission. So I hope you'll help put that right. There's a picture of some people there. Um, and it was either that launch or the international tea drinking competition. You can see a lot of cups there, uh, unused as yet. Um, so what advice could we give to politicians? What would help keep our collaborations going? Um, cooperation, holding hands more often, the peace process that we've seen, uh, parts paid by the, the, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom uh, and Northern Ireland, uh, has been an example, I hope, in terms of here's a, a tortuous and difficult path and nations working together to make this happen um, and work is always in progress, that is politics, I guess. But I hope that uh, whatever is decided doesn't destabilise this in any way. As the study of history and politics has shown us, I'd like to say, Change is possible, progress is slow, but persistence is the key. I just thought I'd see how that played. You've gone into silence, that's good. Um, very quickly, sense of humour is very important, and North Korea does have the edge. There are more laughs around Kim Jong-un <laughs> than any other Premier at the moment. Um, is there any other advice we would offer? <laughs> Possibly that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
towards the end about, you know, we've talked a lot and you hear a lot in the debate about the extent to which psychology and cognitive disciplines might improve welfare through, you know, influencing government behaviour and so on. Um, but, you know, there's in a really large potential for psychology to be used in the opposite direction. And I think regulators are only really starting to come to terms with that. Well, what happens if you've got people that are combining large data with very clever psychological models to look at how people are making decisions? It opens up a, a whole range of areas. And I, I think that's where we need to be spending a lot more time talking. Um, in terms of the history of economics and psychology, it pains me to do this because I'm in the middle of writing a 300-year history. It's, that's about as long as it's going to take me to write it, to be honest with you. But um, economics and psychology have interacted throughout, you know, go back e easily, e e go back as far as the Scottish Enlightenment before that. And you've got great figures in the 20th century like Herbert Simon who belong uh, to many traditions. So when, when I hear things like, you know, is behavioural economics, psychology and new bottles and so on, I, I think if you really sit back and think about it, those statements don't make any sense in the sense that economics and psychology sort of peeled off of philosophy at different times in history and, and always sort of interacted with each other in different ways. Uh, and I think what's happening at the moment is they're coming back together. And we've not yet figured out a good, a good phrase for it. We're calling it behavioural science. Um, but that, you know, that could mean many different things. But you are seeing a huge amount of uh, um, interaction uh, between the disciplines. I think Kahneman and Tversky certainly are uh, quite prominent and deservedly so in, in the current debate. Um, as you know, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics. He's a psychologist. Infuriatingly to economists, he said it's not even the hardest prize he's won. <laughs> Apparently, the American Psychological Association prize is harder to win, according to Daniel, which uh, didn't endear him to a lot of economists. Well, they only award it every two years, so I guess. Um, and they, they really what they did was they said a lot of economic assumptions that are used in economic models are, are flawed, and they took direct aim at them. So they looked at things like how people made decisions under risk, they looked at how people used information, and it led to the award of the Nobel Prize. And it also led to really economists bringing psychology back in again, and, and that had many sort of unintended consequences. Um, so Richard Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize in economics just a few months ago, <coughs> He'd read uh, Thomas Kuhn's theory of structure uh, of scientific revolution, and he sort of cheated, which is you're not actually supposed to consciously create a scientific revolution. It's, it's, it's supposed to sort of happen, whereas he did. So he, he actually took concepts from the literature like anomalies and wrote a column in one of the main economics journals basically saying, look, psychologists know lots of stuff about human behavior that we need to take into account. And uh, he had a really revolutionary effect on economics, so much so that I think for those of you outside the discipline would, would be quite surprised to see how psychological a discipline it's become again. Am I, am I wandering a bit? Yes, sorry. I have a friend who's got a collection of photographs of me wandering about stages. Um, <laughs> And they, they came up with the idea that not only are these things interesting for the academic literature, these are potentially big uh, things for how we should organize our society, regulation and so on. So Sunstein is a lawyer. He's the most cited lawyer uh, of his generation and came up with this idea that, you know, laws are not just things that shape incentives. They're psychological phenomena. He even has phrases such as like constitutions are basically communication devices in some respects. Uh, he came up with this beautiful idea of the idea of the expressive function of law, which is that laws change incentives, but they also communicate th things to, to, to people. Uh, so this field of behavioral economics, the idea that you know, emotion matters for behavior, so a lot of psychological effects, well known, at least well known to, to many psychologists, should, should come in to the study of economics, should come into the study of how we set laws, regulations, uh, and so on. So I won't go through all of those, but... Um, uh, to summarize them, basically, the new field argues that economics should incorporate bounded rationality, which is, you know, complexity, people's capacity to understand complicated problems, etc. Bounded willpower, which is that, you know, a lot of decisions are, are you know, even if you had information, there's, there, there's difficulties in, in motivating yourself to do things, particularly if they're complicated or unpleasant in the short run, and that people care about fairness more than traditional economic models had suggested. Everyone got quite fascinated by this example. I wish I had more time to explain the limits of it. I think, I think many of you will know that this is a bit of a misleading picture, which, which is that you know, in countries where you have to opt out, um, many people don't. don't. So uh, people stay in the organ um, registers if they have to opt out. And if they, if they have to opt in, it's quite less. Um, but it did trigger a huge amount of debate. And it got people thinking that maybe, well, if people do have these psychological 
constraints when it comes to making these types of decisions. Perhaps we should change regulation, governance, laws, etc., such that you could make people make the socially and personally beneficial option, make that the easier option. And they came up with this phrase, which you'll hate, I think, most people hate it, libertarian paternalism, which was the idea that, look, we could use psychology, use behavioral science to, to really design uh, our systems such that you could um, retain freedom of choice. So at the moment, we're often enrolling 13 million people into pensions in the UK, but they can opt out if they want to. But you, you, there is a paternalistic aim. We've got climate change, we've got obesity, we've got all of these problems of financial instability. So we should be trying to harness the power of the state and regulation and so on and so forth. And they wrote this book, uh, Libertarian Paternalism. And now, again, you're probably wondering how this became, this is still on the bestseller list 10 years later. Um, selling millions of copies all around the world was read by politicians. And this is where the political psychology becomes interesting because their publisher clearly knew more about what Ashley was talking about than these guys did and said, lads, you can't call it libertarian paternalism. There's too many syllables. Politicians won't engage with it. Um, so it became nudge. Um, and that was very effective. If it is one syllable in a political context, it's certainly going to travel a lot further. And nudge is, you know, it comes out of this really centuries of debate about how psychology should be brought in uh, to economics without, you know, um, impinging too much on people's autonomy. You, you, you want to create active systems where people you know, have autonomy and choice and dignity and all of these types of things, but uh, we do have problems of financial instability, inequality, health problems and so on that might be at least somewhat changed by more active design. And Thaler uh, won the Nobel Prize, so again, this, this stuff has you know, become quite prominent. Regulators, governments around the world are thinking about it. The Institute for Government published this report, uh, Mindspace, which was a, an attempt to sort of summarize all that we know in psychology and cognate literatures in a way that policymakers could engage with. It's nine letters. Uh, again, the purists in the room, certainly if you're familiar with Susan Mitchie's work and so on about the, the, the amount of ways you can influence people's behavior, and this is a real simplification. They've since reduced it down to four, uh, east, because uh, nine was, was already becoming difficult for folks to engage with. It's not a bad summary. I mean, it's an attempt to say if you wanted to uh, influence people's behavior, whether it's to get them to pay tax on time or so on and so forth, these are the various different methods that you could use to engage it. And this framework became very popular and is quite widely used across different government departments. Um, then all sorts of strange things started to happen. So Obama hired Sunstein as his chief regulator. Uh, Cameron uh, hired, uh, set up um, um, the behavioral insights team in the cabinet office that started with a you know, small number of people. is now 150 staff doing hundreds of trials across pretty much every area of government and regulation. You've got groups like the Education and Endowment Foundation that are doing, um, I think, something like a quarter of British school, school children are in some sort of a trial. Uh, so this is, you know, this is quite big stuff. Uh, executive orders, when they used to have a better connotation than they do now. Uh, Obama, I think there is a behavioral team still somewhere in the White House. I don't think Trump has found them yet. Or he just hasn't. I think actually behavioral science would be okay under Trump. I just don't, I think he'll just not bother with it. You know, it's just, uh, I was asking people about it. Like, even some of the policies that came in under Obama, he's just, like, it would be just so, the details are, are so sort of under the radar for someone like uh, the current president that should, some of them might just survive by accident. Um, but executive orders are big things in the States. So this is basically saying every federally funded project in the United States has to go through some sort of, whether you want to call it behavioral or psychological audit. So it really opens up whether under the current regime or the next, it certainly opens up a massive uh, area for psychology. Um, I think it opens up areas of practice that are staggering, really, if you think about them in their scale. We've had similar things before in economics, you know, around things like environmental economic evaluations and so on that really created whole sort of groups. Um, and again, we're seeing projects all across the world. Um, pension participation is a big one, simplification of tax and legal systems. And then stuff that, I guess, overlaps with what psychologists have always been working on, like health promotion and so on. Um, but, but as I said, increasingly seeing psychologists and economists who are trained in psychological research methods working in, in areas like tax authorities and so on. Um, so this is a, a slightly busy map, but this is 200 organizations around the world, including five in Ireland that I've been working with. Uh, who are doing trials in this area. The, these teams, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to argue with people afterwards. I think the phrase, phrase behavioral science is not a bad word for this. It's not quite psychology. There are multidisciplinary teams involved. And the word behavioral science acts as a sort of neutral 
way of getting around some of the tribalism, um, because some, not all of this is psychology. Some of it is, you know, econometrics and those types of disciplines. So it acts as a sort of, if you look at the literature on transdisciplinarity, you see these, these sort of hybrid fields emerging in other areas. Um, but I still think there's absolutely nothing stopping psychology and psychology graduates applying in all of these uh, different areas. So I guess that's my positive message. I'm not a very good TED talker. I tend to look at the negatives quite a bit. But from, from a psychology point of view, um, this is this is a you know really interesting area, and I, I've tracked. A, I've seen my students. I've I've been teaching psychology classes since 2007, so I've seen students now move relatively senior in some organisations. It's fascinating to see some of the things that they're doing. So let me move on to the negative part. So start with the positive, and then end with the negative. Uh, there is dramatic um, potential for ethical dilemmas here. Uh, increasingly, I think the more we look at psychology and economics, the more, the more we realize maybe what's common sense, but you start structurally re realizing it, the scope for, for exploitation in markets with lots of complexity. So these are two Nobel winners who wrote this really dramatic book, basically saying that markets are not necessarily ways of satisfying consumer demands. Markets are ways of figuring out how to exploit consumer biases in the most efficient way. And if you look at uh, that lens, you see it everywhere. And so we, we, um, if we look at this, how you could use psychology or use big data and all of this sort of personalized nudging to do all of this type of stuff. I mean, we see it all the time now. There is a big movement towards merging things like big data, personalization, and so on. So, I mean, and if you look at the structure of a lot of products, we've got like complex products that, um, you know, we've got an entire field that's good at doing these things. We would know how to capture somebody's attention, minimize salient fees, maximize invisibility, uh, give less prominence to more negative aspects of products and so on, obfuscation, all sorts of time horizons on a product. So let me, let me try something right now. So I'm going to offer you uh, 1,000 euro right now, or you can have 1,100 euro in a month. Who would like 1,000 euro right now? Who would like 1,100 euro in a month? So about half of you. So about half of you are about to have just incurred a payday penalty. So if I ask you, would you like 1,000 euro in a year? or 1,100 euro in a year in a month? Who would like 1,000 euro in a year? Who would like 1,100 euro in a year in a month? So everyone's hand went up quickly. There's usually one person who looks for the 1,000 euro in a month. But these are powerful effects. So you sort of think, who would take out a payday loan? That's very irrational. If I phrase um, options to you in a certain way, if I, if I work on the timing of it, if I do all of these types of things, you can get people to do things that are you know, quite, look quite extreme at first glance. And I won't go through all of these, but like, you would, <laughs> You know, uh, it would it would make it would give you pause to think about what happens when we have lots and lots of folks going into work in these areas. It's not all ambiguously good. And I would also say it's not just that industry has a, an, an ethical potential issue with this. I mean, with governments doing all these things with data, um, if we've got areas like organ donation, areas like health promotion, where there's already quite a lot of discussion of ethics, some of these areas have not yet developed such a deep discussion. I think they're doing their best. You've got people that are in those areas. Uh, but when we think of things like accountability, so um, with something like nudging, it doesn't have the same level of accountability as something like law. Or, um, uh, excuse me, uh, you know, things where, where either parliament or judges can have some oversight over these things. Often these are decisions that are being made by bureaucrats with very large amount of data and getting much better at figuring out how to use it and so on. And I think we need to have a lot more discussion about transparency in those sorts of areas, uh, the, the extent to which we could be manipulating people, um, the importance of autonomy, individual autonomy in these areas where, again, very big debates of these already in medical literature is less so if we're talking about financial regulation or tax compliance or those types of things because they're sort of a different set of issues. The avoidance of harm. I mean, we've seen in the UK, I think, some fairly you know, unwise um, uses of influence techniques, particularly, um, I don't know if I should, well, let's say some of the stuff the Home Office has been doing um, doesn't, doesn't look good at, at face value. I mean, I'd like to see a lot more about how exactly the decisions were made, but you've seen lots of um, examples of attempts to influence people's behavior that, that looked quite tricky. Uh, we've got issues of research integrity, uh, particularly publication bias. Some of these literatures were not very policy relevant and suddenly became policy relevant very quickly. Um, so there's a big discussion about how you overcome publication bias and so on when they're being applied directly. And as I said, the power of administrative discretion in some of these areas. Okay, so let me just uh, finish. I think this is 
very interesting. I think the psychology and economics are coming together in a way that's as big as any time since the Scottish Enlightenment. I really think you're seeing um, something that's not a fad. I've used this phrase a few times before. It might be a big mistake, um, but it's not a fad. It's too deeply embedded at this stage. This is around for the next uh, decade at least. Uh, I think it has big implications for where psychology graduates can work and the type of things that psychologists will be doing uh, in, the in the next decade. Uh, I think there's an increasing professionalization of this area in government, teams being formed all around the world. Uh, and I think um, it also has implications for private, uh, for private concerns in terms of the ethical use of this in business. Uh, so let me, yeah, let me leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>